well, it's my great pleasure to welcome you. Thank you very much. And in particular, a warm welcome for making such an effort to get to us. Uh, it's not what I'd call the best two days of Sydney transport history. And uh, so this morning uh, I was driving through heavy rain on the uh, expressway up from Wollongong, thinking I wonder what time I'll actually get there. So uh, I just very much appreciate the fact that many of you have made an effort particularly to be with us, and thank you. I'd like to uh, begin by paying tribute to Elders past and present, and in particular to those who are serving uh, in the ADF from First Nations. It's my pleasure now to hand over to our event coordinator, uh, Ron Lyons. Ron will properly introduce our guest speaker and will also uh, advise you as to who will thank. Ron, thank you. Over to you. Thanks, Michael. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second of our monthly lecture series for 2022. The overall theme of our activities this year, as the President has said, is improving Australia's regional security. And the title of today's lecture is Defence and Aerospace New South Wales, Building a Sovereign Defence Industry Capability. It'll be presented by Air Vice, Air Vice Marshal Kim Osley, AM, CSC retired, who is the New South Wales Defence Advocate which is a part of a state government department called Investment New South Wales. Kim will explain the roles of the Defence Advocate, Investment New South Wales and Defence and Aerospace New South Wales in supporting New South Wales defence industry. He'll highlight how these entities coordinate support for the defence industry across the New South Wales government and also the Department of Defence in order to deliver good defence industry outcomes for New South Wales. Kim will discuss how the defence industry in New South Wales can provide a more resilient supply chain for the Department of Defence through innovation and development of key future capabilities with less reliance on overseas sources. He will also describe the support provided through the Regional New South Wales Defence Network, the New South Wales Defence Innovation Hub and other initiatives along with the issues facing New South Wales defence industry in gaining defence work. Some challenges for the future will be the increasing need for a large, larger defence industry workforce and how to build defence industry exports. Kim Osley has had over 45 years experience with defence and defence industry, including 38 years full-time service with the Royal Australian Air Force, where he initially trained as a fast jet weapons systems officer. He is commanded at all levels through to two-star rank and held fl unit flying commands at the flight, squadron, wing and group levels. In 2006-2007, he was attached to the US military and served as the Director of Combined Air Operations Centre in the Middle East. Kim was the Australian Department of Defence Senior Representative in the US in 2008 to 2010 and performed a similar role representing the RAAF in the UK in 1999 to 2002. He was the lead force designer for the Australian Department of Defence in 2004 to 2006 and was head of the Australian F-35 program in 2010 to 2013. He still serves in uniform on a part-time basis in the RAAF Active Reserve, working on various Air Force and broader defence tasks. After leaving full-time military service in 2014, Kim was the Managing Director in the Canberra office of Price Waterhouse Coopers, a strategic advisor and consultant to the Department of Defence on several projects and activities. This included designing the Defence Force design process and the developing of the Force Structure Plan 2020. This plan will guide the investment of approximately $270 billion in defence spending over the next decade. He was awarded the Defence Industry Service Commendation in 2019 for his work 
over the period 2016 to 2019 in strategic acquisition planning for defence. Kim is currently the New South Wales Defence Advocate and a non-executive director with a New South Wales Aerospace Composite Company. He is also an independent member of the PricewaterhouseCoopers Global Government Defence Network Board and is a Fellow of the Australian Institute of Navigation. He is also a Fellow of the Centre for Defence and Strategic Studies, Patron of the Australian Federation Guard and is the Chair of the Australian Air Force Cadets Foundation Board, which supports the 7,800 strong Australian Air Force Cadet Organisation. Kim has a Master's Degree in both Arts and Defence Studies, a BSc Physics from Melbourne University and is a graduate of the Harvard Business School. In 1997, he was awarded the Conspicuous Service Cross for services to Air Force strategic planning and was made a member of the Order of Australia in 2008 for his services to air combat. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome our speaker, Kim Osler. Well, thank you, Ron, and uh, thank you, Michael. And with that sort of introduction, I just wish my mother was here. It's, uh, um, I know it was a little bit long there, and uh, I'll probably um, just right at the very start, I'll, I'll just quickly touch on um, some of that background that sort of uh, um, has enabled me, I think, to come into this job as New South Wales Defence Advocate um, with uh, uh, at least um, some sort of uh, concept of, um, of how I can assist. Um, I also would like to acknowledge the uh, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and, uh, and acknowledge their um, elders past and present. Um, I really, today is about giving you some insights into um, what the New South Wales government uh, is doing, what investment New South Wales, um, what defence and aerospace New South Wales, and very importantly, what I'm doing to help industry uh, within this state and defence industry around Australia. So um, hopefully you'll end up with um, a bit of a no knowledge of that at the end of the day. I am going to try and ask you to, um, um, to do some stuff going into the future as well, things that you can do to help us with um, promoting defence industry and its support to defence. Um, I'll just um, quickly... Uh, uh, you, you can't have an aviator up here without having some pictures. And um, so... Uh, just to, to uh, add to what Ron pointed uh, said there, I started out um, as um, uh, everyone's seen Top Gun, so I was Goose. So I um, w uh, started out in the um, F-111, then went into the uh, Phantom with the United States Air Force, the F-4. Um, that was my introduction to working with the Americans, and I think it uh, gave me a, a good introduction. I was a flight commander on Phantoms um, during the Cold War times, and uh, and then after that. Um, as Ron pointed out, I was lucky enough to stay in the flying game and went all the way through. Of course, you can't fly all your life, and uh, so my secondary um, stream was force design. And force design is about what do we buy in the future. And um, so a fellow called uh, General David Hurley was the um, boss of, um, uh, of the area that looked after force design, and I became the... the first force designer working in that organisation back in 2004. Um, and so uh, that, that gave me some great insights into, I think, um, how we needed to develop capability, but also how industry could support it. And then I had those military diplomacy um, sort of um, postings over to the UK and as head of defence staff in Washington. And that was a uh, great experience engaging with industry overseas. So between that, looking after the F-35 program, and uh, you can see just the very first Australian F-35 on the left there uh, coming down the production line, and, um, and also doing reserve service where I supported Australian industry and took them overseas and took them to meet companies overseas as part of my um, um, uh, reserve service there. I, um, I think I ended up with a good understanding of what was required uh, to support industry. And of course, then with Price Waterhouse Coopers, we engaged in supporting precincts, industry precincts um, uh, within Australia and defence industry. So not a, not a bad mix there. Um, the briefing flow. Um, I, I will talk about um, uh, what is you know 
why the focus on defence industry and then talk through what each of the areas does. Um, I'll focus mainly though on uh, what, um, what is the strategy, what are the things we're actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis to help and then, uh, and then not up there but how you can assist. So firstly, um, uh, why should there be a focus on defence industry? And it really comes down to, uh, it is big business. I think most of you understand that and uh, that it's um, a multi-billion dollar business, but it's also key to our security. It really is. We can't uh, continue to rely on only in being a major importer of, um, of defence capability. We need the ability to support and sustain it within Australia. And um, you can sort of see there that um, in terms of being um, big business, uh, we are currently at about uh, $44.6 billion a year in defence budget. That is going to grow to $75 billion by the end of the decade. Now, some of that, of course, is inflation, but it's real growth in there as well. So um, uh, since um, to deliver that does require Australian defence industry to step up and actually uh, about um, for this past year, $2 billion extra has been, uh, is going to be spent year on year more in Australia um, uh, going forward and we're going to see um, this sort of trend continue. There's about 175 major and minor projects underway at this point in time and there's almost been a doubling in recent years of the number of the largest category of projects. So um, we have very high uh, consistently high levels of defence funding expected between now and uh, into the foreseeable future and we have a, a key role for defence industry to support that. Um, defence industry um, only represents 1.7% of the economic endeavours in Australia, only, um, but 1.7% is in itself significant. In what that means in New South Wales, about 27,000 people are in defence or defence industry. Um, there's about 3,800 um, additional jobs every year for the next few years that we need to actually um, create um, in Australia, across Australia, not just New South Wales, um, in addition to the 45,000 or so defence industry um, and defence jobs that there already exist out there. And um, just um, a, a, a key marker is that 75% of New South Wales defence companies are currently looking for staff and, um, and of those, many of them are after higher educated um, uh, either university graduates or tradespeople to support it. The, um, the other downside I guess in the current workforce is that we do have in defence industry a, a, a relatively ageing workforce. I'm an example of that. And, um, and so we need to think about um, how do we actually create this new generation and get the young people to see defence industry as being a great alternative um, compared to the more traditional ones of IT or finance or other endeavours. The, um, just thinking about um, uh, what the art of the possible is for Australia. Exports are, are going to be key to establishing Australian industry into the future. Um, for Australian industry to be sustainable, you can't just rely in general on the Australian Defence Force to be the sole market that the Australian industry gets involved in. You've got to think exports. Traditionally, we've been a very large importer of um, of, of defence equipment. So um, typically we're in the top five in the last few years, occasionally been um, second uh, behind, say, Saudi Arabia. So we have a history of importing uh, arms, but we need to now really focus on how we're going to export that. And uh, we have had the Australian government focus very heavily on that. We have seen that um, paying dividends. We've gone from a relatively low um, point to a, about a threefold increase um, in this past year and even before that, we, before COVID, we are up around the four or five times what we traditionally had exported. So we are up around um, 2.7 billion in this uh, last period but we have been as high as about 5 billion. Um, keeping in mind that that puts us as a, at about the 20th to 25th largest defence exporter, we have got a ways to go before we get to the top 10. 
And so we need to think about how we can do that. And just to put it in perspective, um, you think, well, um, can Australia really reach that sort of target? Well, Canada has about the same population as Australia. Canada has about the same level of defence expenditure as Australia, and yet they are roughly four times the size in terms of defence industry and, uh, and certainly exports. So we, we need to think what is the art of the possible here. We'll have a quick look at um, exactly what the New South Wales government and um, Defence and Aerospace uh, New South Wales does to support uh, defence uh, industry there. I'll start with Investment New South Wales. And um, so the organi I'm, my job as a defence advocate, and I'll talk a bit more about it later, is I'm actually um, part-time. So I, I'm, I, am a, um, uh, I serve part-time in the role, and I have other roles that you heard about um, when uh, Ron was talking there. Uh, but we have a, uh, quite a large number of people that are working full-time supporting defence and aerospace, and those people are, are within Investment New South Wales. Um, Investment New South Wales is a relatively new agency. Um, it was only uh, started in, or created in March 2020. Um, its role is broader than defence. Its role is to be a concierge for private sector investment and uh, they are to s support getting exports and working both domestically and globally. And they're focused very much in attracting companies to New South Wales and growing jobs in the existing companies within Australia. Um, so uh, it really is about um, uh, uh, how they can do that best and they work um, with regional New South Wales, which I think many people would be familiar with, growing jobs around the state, but also working with uh, areas such as um, the Airtropolis, which is now uh, known as the um, um, Bradfield in uh, Western Sydney there as well, and working through their overseas trade commissioners to generate uh, overseas uh, work. We now come down to uh, Defence and Aerospace New South Wales and um, I think many in the room have probably come across um, uh, Mr Mike Gallagher who is uh, full time as the Director of Defence and Aerospace New South Wales and um, he a, a, was a commander in the Navy, he was a submarine commanding officer, he has quite strong defence credentials and he has a team of about 10 staff that work with him to, um, to generate good outcomes for defence industry. Um, the key, one of the key things that they have to do is to implement the 2017 Defence Industry Strategy for New South Wales, strong, smart and connected. And um, we are in the process of updating that now because there have been a number of developments more recently, but that is very much focused on um, connecting defence and defence industry. So um, I'd like to liken it to a, a dating service, so, you know, uh, engaging, with, um, engaging with industry, engaging with defence, identifying who the best match is and then connecting them up. And um, uh, it, it, you'd be surprised uh, that um, you, the amount of effort that must go into doing that sort of thing to ensure that we end up with the right company engaging on the right project with the right people in defence. For a lot of companies outside of defence, it's very opaque and uh, very hard to find the right person. The other one is identifying those key opportunities and uh, again I'll talk through a few of those uh, a little bit later. Things like maritime and guided weapons. So, um, and, and now of course um, uh, what is um, uh, some of the other areas that they uh, assist in? Uh, supporting the New South Wales regions and um, you know there's uh, a number of regions uh, around. It's not just all located in Sydney. We do have um, a strong defence presence in the Hunter, um, down near Nowra, Shoalhaven, uh, around the Albury Wagga area is another um, uh, conglomeration of uh, de and, and um, uh, of defence industry, and right next to Canberra in Queanbeyan, there is um, also developing a precinct there uh, called the Capital Area, and then there's Bradfield I mentioned in Western um, Sydney. So. Um, some regions have uh, resources, such as the Hunter, and they, they assist themselves. Other regions are heavily de um, reliant on defence and aerospace New South Wales, on Mike Gallagher and his team to assist them. The, um, just in terms of uh, my own um, 
role. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm part time, and uh, the um, it probably might surprise you that a lot of my job is actually um, involved in dealing with defence and breaking down the barriers to um, uh, for defence industry in in consultation and engaging with the defence um, advocates in other states and territories. So um, we don't. Um, it isn't an adversarial relationship that we have in uh, uh, that I have as the um, New South Wales Defence Advocate. Um, we're actually trying to create um, a larger pie, I think, in terms of defence industry around Australia, and um, we spend uh, time doing that rather than fighting over a particular slice of that pie. Um, when we when we talk about breaking down barriers, some of the barriers that are at the highest level, and my role is to sort of engage with defence and see what we can do to promote, um, uh, uh, make it easier for companies to do uh, business with defence. I talked to them about things like security. How can we actually get security clearances organised uh, easier? How can we uh, ensure that companies have access um, to documentation that might be classified? Um, how do they go through that process of getting that accreditation? Um, how do we minimise um, acquisition and contracting um, and barriers? to companies? Um, how do we improve the global supply chain? How do we uh, improve defence innovation? So we need to uh, think about some of those policy things. I do mentor a lot of um, uh, defence industry, so I will get several calls a week and um, they'll ask me who do they need to talk to, um, they'll explain what they do um, and, um, and then um, I provide advice on, on who I think uh, might be interested across defence in that particular area, introduce them to um, uh, larger companies, um, the international OEMs uh, on occasion, connect them uh, through um, various um, defence representation abroad, provide advice on their strategy and solve their problems. An example of solving a problem is, um, uh, for instance, one of the companies in New South Wales um, had to send its product to the US or South Korea to be tested. Now you can imagine you design it in Australia, you then got to ship it overseas, test it and then bring it back to Australia because it radiated and caused um, uh, um, potential problems for communication and media. And, um, and, so, uh, uh, and then they would find a fault in it, bring it back to Australia, fix it, send it back overseas and obviously that slowed down the process. So we worked with the Australian Communications and Media Authority to um, ensure that we could get a dispensation to have that done in Australia. And so that sort of thing is the uh, type of problem that we, we try and solve. Um, we do provide um, support to those uh, uh, various precincts, keeping them aware of what Defence is doing and uh, solving any um, uh, issues that they might have. And we do connect uh, defence and industry in those key emerging areas, space, guided weapons, advanced aerospace, maritime and submarines. And look at how we can support the development of a skilled workforce. Um, I didn't mention it previously, but um, uh, an example of how defence and aerospace and, and, um, and, and therefore myself and, and others in New South Wales government can assist companies is the Jobs Plus program. So um, we use the Jobs Plus program uh, uh, for companies that are expanding. It provides uh, incentives to them to create new jobs. And um, it's about a $250 million program where it's not, um, it's not just across defence, it's uh, broader than that, but it does help defence industry who are planning to expand in Australia, either companies coming in or existing companies that are trying to plus up their workforce. Um, the, uh, just before I, uh, um, while I was having lunch, people were sort of commenting about, um, you know, we really don't understand where defence industry is across New South Wales. And so um, what I thought is I'd just throw a map up there and give you some idea. So um, quite obviously, I'll start with the Hunter. Um, the, um, the Hunter, of course, has Rap Base Williamtown up there, and it's, um, uh, that is a, a massive... Um, uh, base, a super base for the, uh, uh, for the Air Force and um, the, um, uh, it's also the headquarters for BAES for doing their advanced aerospace for the F-35 and that is in fact the, the 
hub for the Asia Pacific, for the F-35, for the global F-35 um, enterprise. Around the uh, Williamtown precinct, there's a number of companies that are now uh, being established and it's becoming a, a mini ecosystem up there. And um, just as an indication, um, the presence of those uh, companies and the presence of Rat-based Williamtown is very significant when it comes to the effect it's had on the local economy there and you can sort of see it when you map out the arrival of the F-35 into the region and the companies that, are, that came in with that and an uptick in the uh, economy in the local area there. So the Hunter is, is growing in terms of, um, uh, of its importance from a, a, an advanced aerospace point of view. We go down south and um, around Shoalhaven and down near Nowra. Uh, very much focused on naval aviation down there and there's a lot of companies that are either providing support direct to the Navy or naval aviation. You might think that uh, the Murray Riverina uh, with Wagga and uh, around Albury um, may not have as much aerospace, uh, sorry, as much um, defence industry. It actually has quite a bit down that way. Uh, we're talking about um, uh, Malwala, we're talking about so um, uh, munitions manufacture, Australian Target Systems is down that way, um, a, um, a great exporter. And other com uh, companies such as uh, BAE Systems, um, various engineering companies um, are down there. And uh, a lot of them are using the local um, uh, population there. They, they've got a great um, workforce down there. And it also, some of the things such as uh, manufacturing munitions take advantage of the relatively um, wide open spaces down there, which is what they need. Um, when we get to um, the capital area next to the ACT, so Canberra has a number of defence companies in it, but right next door at Queanbeyan uh, and Jerobombra, they're creating the Poplars precinct there and um, they're looking at uh, space and advanced technology there as well. And so um, w then if we come back into um, uh, Sydney and you, of course, have uh, a number of companies here in Sydney. And as well as that, we've got um, Western Sydney, Bradfield, um, being created, as well as Tech Central. And Tech Central, just down the road, um, three universities have come together to create an area where we have 25, uh, sorry, 250,000 square metres of, um, of office space there. We've got 100 start-up companies that have been accommodated within there. And it provides this sort of... Um, uh, area, an incubator of innovation and technical uh, excellence right here in the centre of, uh, of Sydney. So um, again, you can sort of see the impact in terms of dollars and the impact in terms of people employed there across the regions. So it's not just a Sydney um, uh, issue when it comes to defence industry, it's something for the whole state. The um, in terms of talking about the key opportunities, th those key opportunities for us really arise from Defence doing some great work back in 2016. So back in, uh, prior to 2016, um, we didn't really articulate, or Defence didn't articulate very well, exactly what its sovereign industry priorities were. And so it sat down and it, it actually came up with a sovereign industrial capability priorities. And that was, what do we really, really want to need uh, do uh, in Australian industry um, right here and what can we afford to um, uh, let um, others um, bring in from uh, outside. And so we um, identified 10 key areas and uh, there were probably no real surprises with those and we can sort of see them uh, up there on the left hand side there. Uh, and so those, those uh, 10 key areas um, were what Defence uh, provided um, funding, uh, additional grants in, so that they could actually promote the development of those um, sovereign industrial capabilities within Australia. And you can see up there that um, uh, under a I'll just pick out a couple of them. Munitions and small arms, New South Wales, with Lithgow, Marwala and Orchard Hills is absolutely an Australian, um, is the uh, centre of, um, of gravity for munitions and small arms manufacture in Australia. And then also aerospace, um, deeper maintenance. Um, as I mentioned before, BAES up at uh, Williamtown is, is the centre of excellence when it comes to um, the F-35. And we've got other deeper maintenance happening out at Rat Base Richmond and other locations. Um, 
when recently they announced another four areas where they wanted um, sovereign industrial capability and you can see them there robotics autonomous systems and artificial intelligence and again new south wales um, has um, a number of startups and a number of companies uh, focused on those guided weapons um, and integrated air and missile defense and williamtown is likely to be a center for that integrated air and missile defense information warfare and cyber and space so um, though they, we've, we have some quite clear guidance from the government about exactly what we should be focused on and what defence wants to invest their dollars in going forward and what they're willing to pay a premium for if need be. Just um, uh, having a look at some of those um, opportunities um, uh, in particular. So uh, starting with the future submarine, and I think Chris Skinner, you've done a, uh, did a great job of uh, talking through the submarine at the last meeting, so I won't go through it in um, great detail. But um, we have the nuclear powered submarine task force down in, um, established in Brindabella Park in Canberra. They've take, taken up a whole building down there and uh, Vice Admiral Jonathan Mead and his team are planning, doing their 18 months of planning and it should have the plan out later this year as to how they're going to uh, develop that capability and how the industrial um, portion of it will be uh, rolled out. Um, Australia is going to be joining a number of nations uh, uh, operating nuclear powered submarines. We're certainly not, um, it, the list is, is quite long, US, UK, France, Russia, China, India and Brazil. So um, a number of nations uh, have uh, gone down that path. So it's not an impossible task, but it is a challenging task. There's going to be a lot of opportunities for New South Wales in um, that endeavour. Um, we're not going to build nuclear reactors in Australia for the submarines. Um, uh, quite obviously, they're going to. Uh, that technology would probably be brought in. But we're certainly going to have to skill our workforce, and um, including nuclear engineering and management. And we have advantages in having ANSTO, which I notice you're going to go and visit in the not too distant future, which is great. And um, and also University of New South Wales is one of the leaders in that in that um, uh, uh, area. So I think we've got a, um, a large part to play in the safety and design and uh, nuclear management of, of those, um, those uh, platforms. Um, I think um, uh, Chris also pointed out the research and development activities, and I know you've dedicated the second half of this uh, year to looking at those um, research and development activities such as cyber, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, and I think um, that's probably the quite exciting part of the ALCAS agreement is the transfer of that technology to us. So um, that'll be great. And the final point I'd like to make there is that the, um, uh, with the nuclear submarine or with any submarine, um, the, the um, idea of an East Coast submarine base um, is, uh, r um, is considered. And uh, right at this point in time, there's a lot of strategic reasons why an East Coast submarine base would be a good idea. And I think that uh, you know, we're well, well down the path of uh, looking at how that might be implemented and quite obviously New South Wales would be uh, one of those being considered. So imagine a uh, large base, um, additional base here in, um, in New South Wales it would obviously have great benefit to industry and great benefit strategically. Um, space is interesting. We've, um, uh, uh, Air Vice Marshal Kath Roberts has uh, just as the first space commander um, or commander of space command has um, uh, just been established down in Canberra. It's, um, uh, it was announced about a year ago um, by the Chief Air Force that it would be established um, from early this year and uh, we're looking at, uh, at an investment of about seven to twelve billion dollars over the next few years in space programs. Um, New South Wales has a very large space industry so um, quite obviously um, New South Wales companies are well placed to support some of those key programs. Two in particular, um, uh, satellite communication program, which is JP102, 9102, and also um, uh, uh, having a sovereign constellation of, of satellites, of, um, of defence related sa satellites under DEF 799. So, um, some great multi billion dollar programs and we've got um, New South Wales companies that are part of that mix at this point in time. The, um, the other areas that um, are great opportunities for defence are the guided weapons enterprise 
And uh, what Defence has realised is that um, uh, we only use guided weapons now uh, on many platforms. So um, the F-35, for example, can't drop a dumb bomb. It, um, it, they don't have the parameters anymore for dropping um, unguided weapons from um, an aircraft like the F-35. All of the weapons are smart weapons nowadays, um, and that is fairly normal across the, um, the platforms. So if we don't have the ability to, to, um, to either make uh, important components of those weapons or make an entire uh, weapon, then we are missing out on an important sovereign capability. So we need to um, focus on that. Um, the um, this defence is spending about a billion dollars to set up um, a guided weapons enterprise here in Australia, and then there's about a hundred billion dollars um, spread across the um, next ten years or so on guided weapons. So uh, it's certainly a lucrative um, program, and we are a leader in that space. The final one there is um, integrated air and missile defence. Um, it is a large program. Um, it really is going to be focused, um, uh, I think, around RAF Base Williamtown, because that is the home of integrated air and missile defence. And one of the most exciting things about that is that instead of having an, ec um, an international uh, prime, it is possible that we could have an Australian prime for that program. And that is, there's, um, it's going to have really complex systems integration, and it is possible that that might be the um, um, the program that enables companies in Australia to come together and build that capability for system integration and program management and actually deliver that program. In the past, we've relied on someone overseas coming in as the prime and then Australian small, medium enterprises underneath. This might be the program where we, we can actually build that Australian capability for the future. I'd like to, um, uh, something near and dear to my heart, uh, F-35, and I know you've got the, um, uh, a discussion about the F-35 next meeting and that, so uh, here you could arm yourself with a few questions for uh, Commander uh, Air Combat Group and, uh, 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 and, or OC-81 Wing who turns up. Um, so the, um, just to um, put it in perspective so we all understand it, um, I've flown in both those aeroplanes and that is exactly how I like to think about it. The F-18, um, if you sat in the F-18, um, it's like a telephone, a, an old telephone. And that is, um, it does one thing, you know, it, it, it's a fighter. And uh, you have a radar and the radar looks ahead and, and the pilot looks at the radar or the WISO looks at the radar and interprets it and then looks at the radar warning receiver and looks at, at this over here and looks at his wingman and talks on the radio and tries to figure out what's happening. So you spend about 80% of your time trying to figure out what's happening and about 20% of your time making a decision. The F-35 is just like an iPhone. It does everything, including making a telephone call, but you don't use it for that too often. So um, the iPhone, uh, the F-35 is like a supersonic iPhone. It, um, it has apps in it, it, it does everything, and um, for instance, if I want to know what my um, fuel's in my wingman's aeroplane, I don't need to ask the wingman what's in it. I look at his aeroplane, and, and, and inside my visor will come up a thing that says, he's got this much fuel, he's got these many weapons, he's looking in this direction. You look in the other direction, and it'll tell you that there's a... Um, an enemy aircraft out there because it's using the sensors outside the aeroplane, synthesising that information and trying to figure out what you need to know. If you look through the floor in the F-18, all you see is your rudder pedals and your big flying boots, and in the F-35 you'll see the ground underneath the aeroplane because the aeroplane has a sensor under there and it thinks that you want to look at the ground, and so you don't get big netting from the aeroplane. So it really is um, an iPhone versus an old classic telephone. So having said that, the, um, uh, we are, this is a, a real game changer, the F-35, and we, are, we invested in this program as a partnership program. And so from an industry perspective, I'll just explain the difference there and what that really means. Why is the F-35 so special to industry? Because um, because our government got into it early enough and we were a partner, that means that we 
get a part of the industry benefit of the program. Um, so you can have sort of three different ways of, of doing it, and that is the partnership idea. You could have build in Australia, like Australian shipbuilding, or you could have just the regular programs where there's an Australian industry content piece that the overseas or, or other uh, primes or OEMs uh, decide how much uh, goes to the Australian industry. Um, because of um, it being a partnership, though, uh, around about 20% of, um, of the F-35 work went to international companies. So about 3,500 companies around the globe are participating in providing that, that work on the F-35. You can see there that um, we're uh, in red down the bottom there. We're right at the end of the, uh, uh, of the program in terms of initialisation of it. We've got final operating capability, three squadrons and a training squadron, uh, 72 aeroplanes that should be in place next year. Uh, we're um, 75 squadrons just standing up at the moment. Um, they've got um, a few pilots uh, already trained up and they'll get the rest of their aircraft and pilots this year. It's a, um, a 15 to $17 billion program. It included a billion dollars spent at RAF Base um, Williamtown. So that's a very, very major um, construction up that way. And, um, and about 500 million at Tyndall, so um, quite significant. Uh, what was different about having the F-35 program and having that partnership element where we actually were sort of guaranteed some strategic work and we were um, well and truly uh, able to bid on the other work, um, the F-35 was the very first project where we mandated, um, the government mandated that um, we were to deliver a world-class fighter, which it is, and it's, you know, supersonic iPhone, but we were to also deliver um, some good outcomes for Australian industry. That was the first time that that has been a mandate in one of our major programs. So um, it uh, certainly made a difference. I was the program manager for uh, some of that period, and I must admit that I spent about 25% of my time um, dealing with uh, Australian industry and trying to get good outcomes uh, on that. So it was uh, it, having a uniform person doing that um, and, uh, and uh, having a team behind me to do that was a real game changer in the early 2000s. Um, what it allowed us to do though was um, uh, we, there was strategic work which was ours to lose um, because we were buying so many aeroplanes and um, so we had companies that were able to bid on that um, and that was such as the, um, the vertical tails there you see on the right hand side. So. Um, 722 ship sets, that is two tails per aeroplane, um, and Quickstep out at Bankstown uh, are building the composites for that and then providing that to Moran down in Melbourne who are putting them together using um, BAES um, machine parts in the middle and then shipping those over and putting them on the production line at uh, Fort Worth. Um, and so th that was um, very much strategic work. Um, then there was also uh, other stuff where you could um, you could bid for it, and that is the um, such as the um, centre fuselage components composites uh, that Quickstep has also at, um, won, and is delivering uh, uh, many hundreds of different parts for the F-35 from its facility out at Bankstown. If you went to Bankstown now, you would see F-35 parts spread across huge hangars uh, out there being manufactured uh, right today. So uh, uh, incredible um, leading edge composite work there uh, that they're, they're doing. Um, also there, the, um, uh, it mentions the um, Australian industry plans as well. So um, uh, in addition to um, the strategic work, we also um, looked at uh, trying to connect Australian industry to the, to the competitive elements of the F-35 program and we developed um, uh, ways of doing that all across Australia including New South Wales companies. Um, the final expectation is that we'll end up with between four and six billion dollars worth of, um, of work just during the production phase, not the sustainment. There'll be many billions of dollars in sustainment as well. So um, it certainly is, uh, has been a, a great program. There was, um, if you look around the aeroplane, and uh, see who's been involved in, in manufacturing parts of it. 
everything from um, ejection seat uh, all the way around through um, weapons adapters. Um, Ferra out of Queensland is doing that, but there's a lot of um, New South Wales companies around there that are making bits and pieces. Like I said, uh, these companies here are part of that 3,500 companies around the globe that are making the 40,000 parts that go into every F-35. And, um, and you can only um, uh, imagine um, uh, how all these parts around the globe come together um, in Fort Worth on a production line that is 1.6 kilometres long. It's just uh, massive. 1.6 kilometres and you can walk that entire line and you can see an aeroplane from, with parts from Australia, um, a, um, an engine coming together that is sitting on a trailer made in Australia, um, the c composite parts from Quickstep coming together and then wings coming together, tails coming together and this production line goes on and as you go down the aeroplane is, is uh, um, uh, being coming together and then finally at the end being coated in the stealth coatings uh, in a facility, then rolling out and going flying. And they're doing about one of those aeroplanes most um, every couple of days is rolling off that production line. So around about 160 a year. So it's quite an incredible undertaking. Um, that, and just um, for your own information, there is no need for the production line to, to move, but they actually have movement on the production line there so that people get the understanding that they've got to um, meet the timelines so that they don't slow the, um, the development of uh, the uh, construction of the aeroplanes down at all. Just on t in terms of F-35 sustainment, um, I'll just say a couple of words about that and that is that um, uh, BAES was selected by um, Lockheed Martin and by the um, partnership, the international partnership uh, uh, with the F-35 to be the Asia-Pacific um, uh, person doing deeper maintenance on the F-35. So that means that they're going to have um, it, um, a number of hangars where they're going to pull the F-35 apart and fix it. The engines will come in from Queensland, from TAE up in Queensland, and uh, so they'll be serviced there and then brought back in. And then after they service the aeroplane and do that deeper maintenance, um, they're going to have to recoat the, uh, the aeroplane. So they're going to have to build a recoating facility, which is, um, it is not uh, your local uh, auto spray painter. This is um, the recoating of the uh, aeroplane is computer controlled, done by robots, and it has to be done to an incredible accuracy. After they recoat it, they put it inside an anechoic chamber, they measure the signature, and if there is a problem with the aeroplane, it goes back in and gets computer touched up to, um, so that it has a very low signature and that signature is uh, managed. So it is quite a, um, an incredible undertaking and that needs to happen probably about every six or seven years for most of the F-35s in our Air Force and those that use the facility from the Asia Pacific. So that is uh, certainly a great thing for New South Wales to have that um, capability at Williamtown. Just um, uh, looking at a few challenges for um, defence, uh, and the first one uh, is one that I think is um, very familiar to everyone here. It is an incredible, incredibly long process to go from uh, doing force design, deciding what you're going to buy, to actually going through the process of issuing um, a, a request for information to companies, putting out a tender, assessing the tender, um, setting up a contract, and then actually delivering the capability. And we are talking about uh, something that can take, um, in the case of the F-35, the, um, the initial work there was probably done in about 2002 to 2006, and then we finally got the aeroplanes uh, starting to be delivered in 2014. So it can be eight years, 10 years. And as we, um, I'm sure Chris would have mentioned with the submarines, you know, that it's an even longer process. So how do you get New South Wales companies to um, come along for that journey? How do, how do you um, ensure that a small, medium enterprise can, um, can be part of that process, can contribute to it, and then not go out of business, I guess, before they actually get to the gravy stroke of, um, of getting on contract? So it does take quite a while. Um, the, 
Also, um, uh, in addition to just um, bidding for those jobs, um, if you're a, uh, um, a small, medium enterprise um, in industry, you've got to get skilled up and meet all the uh, requirements. So uh, you can imagine Lockheed Martin um, wants to know that people have the right uh, quality accreditations, the right security accreditations. And, and uh, for the F-35, some of those, um, getting the people skilled up, took uh, around about six years. From the time that they were identified, they, um, um, Lockheed Martin provided the training, uh, etc., and then they got to the point where they could actually perform. They performed test articles, and then the test articles were accepted. Um, the other one is connecting um, the right companies with the right OEMs and, uh, and the right primes. And so Defence wants to deal with a single OEM or prime on most projects. They don't want to deal with 20 or 30 companies. They want to deal with one. And that one company then needs to deal with the Australian companies. And then the Australian companies need to have subcontractors to assist them in delivering what they're delivering. All of that um, takes communication, You've got to, um, people have to partner, people have to go through that process. So again, um, that's a key part of what I do and what, um, and what Defence and Aerospace New South Wales do is ensuring that those companies know who to talk to and who to establish relationships with. Um, the other one on the screen there is about the um, uh, uh, foreign exchange. You would think that foreign exchange wouldn't be an issue, but uh, American OEMs do their contracts in American dollars. So while the Australian dollar is um, point, uh, is 70 cents, that's good. You know, they, they make a good profit. If you do a contract at 70 cents and then it becomes a dollar 14 like it was in, in uh, 2010 or so, uh, 2009, then um, uh, that's a 44% change. And so you go, well, uh, if you haven't hedged enough and your profit margin is 15%, then you can have a number of companies that actually go, well, there's, uh, um, we're, we're, we're doing it for the contracted price, but we're going to make a loss. And so uh, when I was the F, uh, looking after the F-35, there were some examples where people had not hedged in companies and they actually were making a loss even though they won the contract and, and were delivering against it. Uh, temporarily until the exchange rate changed. So it's something that you've got to watch out for. And uh, the, um, just, um, I've mentioned before about security requirements and uh, getting a clearance, you know, you, um, the F-35 um, has very classified elements to it and to get the highest levels of clearance can take a year or more. And, um, and so if you have staff that in industry that need to have that access, then you've got to think well in advance to ensure that that happens. And the final one up there um, about international tracking, trafficking in arms. If you're dealing with American technology, then they have the ITAR regulations. And the ITAR regulations are very onerous and, um, and they really enforce them in the US. And that means that um, if an American company passes you information on an American system that is, uh, uh, and you have that access to that information, you, you are being held responsible for that information and they, um, they monitor it, they look at how you um, support it in your IT system, they look at who has access to that information and um, an example I'll give is um, one of our companies um, happened to go into um, a receivership for various reasons and um, I had to race down to Melbourne to ensure that the ITAR information in that company was being looked after. You couldn't just have administrators come into the company and have access to everything. So there are elements, uh, interesting uh, things that can happen there. Um, just moving on to the workforce, and uh, you can see up there that um, uh, the New South Wales government, the Commonwealth government, defence and defence industry are all doing uh, different things to assist um, uh, in developing that workforce. I mentioned before the importance of, of getting about 4,000 extra people into defence industry each year. Um, you can see here some examples of um, where uh, we uh, of getting um, folk engaged in STEM activities and uh, bringing them in to experience 
defence uh, industry work. Uh, I'll just chat about just a couple of the um, of the programs there. So um, the um, uh, you can sort of see up there that there's um, um, STEM ship programs um, from the New South Wales government, and that is that uh, we actually have um, uh, we have people at year 11, year 12 that are, um, are put on these programs. They then are engaged with the industry. They get to experience um, that industry, and hopefully that that gives them a, a pathway into that career. Um, the Defence Innovation Network um, uh, a pre uh, internship as well. You can see that under New South Wales Government and that is um, where the Defence Innovation Network, which is based here in Sydney, um, they identify PhD candidates at the universities and connect them into industry so that they do their internship and we get innovation and we get um, those people entering into defence industry. So uh, that's um, uh, some great programs that they, they do. Um, I'll point out one in defence because it, it, it's one that I'm involved in and that is STEM for Youth and Cadets, so uh, under um, uh, defence. So um, w under the Air Force Cadets we have 7,800 cadets and under that, um, that, uh, in that organisation we run a Pathways to an Aerospace and Defence Career um, uh, programme. The aim there is that we connect with the defence industry and they provide activities that we then take the cadets to out in the field. So just say if I, I use Quickstep, I was mentioning them before, um, Quickstep would then host a cadet unit visiting, they would uh, show them what they do with the F-35 and the C-130, they would have someone out of their organisation who has been a cadet or been in the defence force talk to them and then um, over a few hours they would um, walk them through the process and they would also um, give them an activity to do that is aerospace related and then we can do that across Airbus at Richmond uh, have agreed to it, um, air services out at the airport, Qantas, um, Alliance Airlines, there's a number of companies around about um, 70 at the moment and we are expecting about 150 across Australia that will support um, those cadets and, um, and basically it means you don't have to be a pilot uh, you know, uh, only or a air combat officer or a weapon systems officer. Uh, we're after IT professionals. We're after um, lawyers involved in aerospace. We're after um, doctors that want to specialise in aerospace. We're after um, program managers and things like that. So it's very much orientated towards the entirety of defence industry as well as defence uh, in promoting. Um, supply chain resilience, I did mention that the last time I spoke here and it uh, really, um, the COVID has um, given us, I guess, um, uh, has forced us to really look at supply chain resilience and it comes out in two particular ways. One is we need more Australian industry capability in uh, many areas so that we aren't as reliant on overseas supply chains and also we need to be aware that um, in Australian industry that uh, the US and other countries are doing the same thing. And what that means is um, if we're going to export into the US and remain part of their supply chain, we've got to meet their expectations, but also it might mean we need to reach out and embed some of our people in their uh, industry ecosystem um, overseas. So uh, we need to think about how we do that. The um, uh, final two points I'd like to make about um, some of the challenges is um, delivering Australian industry capability plans. So every major project in defence has an Australian industry capability program. If it ticks um, a certain amount of money, you know, $20 million, whatever, then, then it must have an Australian industry capability plan. The challenge is actually delivering against that because those Australian industry capability plans are considered at the tender evaluation stage but when we get right down to it we've got to actually deliver against them for, to be effective. We have done that with the F-35 and we've, we're um, on track to deliver that but that has taken a lot of political and defence effort to make that happen. So we need to uh, ensure that we, we really do focus on not only developing those Australian industry plans, but making sure that we can, in fact, uh, um, use our political power, our state and, 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 and um, uh, federal government uh, levels to, to actually drive those through and make sure that they are delivered against. And the 
the final one there is um, um, is really developing an Australian prime, and I mentioned that one before. You know, um, for years we've been reliant on uh, having an overseas international company come in and be the major uh, coordinator, the major systems integrator, the major prime for our programs and have Australian industry work under that. We must get to the point, and, and we've got a number of companies that are right on the cusp of it, um, we, we must get to the point where an Australian company is able to prime those very, very large defence programs, and uh, then I think we'll be successful. The example, I think, is um, Air 6500 at Williamtown, Integrated Air and Missile Defence. I really think that that project will be the one that might be um, uh, provide that uh, core uh, uh, around which we could uh, that Australian prime could be developed. Um, I, the focus for um, 2022 and beyond, uh, I've uh, just got a few dot points there, but I'll, I'll actually finish by sort of... Um, uh, sort of explaining what I think you can do as individuals and as a group. Um, you, we really need um, people of, with your background, your skill set, your knowledge, um, your influence to be the advocates for Australian industry and uh, not just New South Wales industry but Australian defence industry. Um, it's, you need to uh, you know, be able to convey that it's good commercially, it's good economically for Australia, but it's good nationally for our security. If we don't have this, we're not going to deliver that $270 billion plan. We're not going to have the sustainment we need in Australia. We are not going to um, be as strong as we can uh, going into a very uncertain future. Um, we need to be individually um, thinking about how can we promote defence industry as a career pathway, a valid career pathway. I do it through my Air Cadet um, pathway program. Um, other people will do it through different means. And so we need to think about um, how do you engage um, with schools? How do you engage with youth organisations? We've got to convince the um, people that it might only represent 1.7% out there and there's IT and there's financial services and there's a whole bunch of other different opportunities but defence industry is a very worthwhile career and we need to think about how we do that. Um, we also uh, in, need to really generate an understanding of the importance of the key programs and by that I think you're on the right path, you know, nuclear submarines um, and the concept of an east coast submarine base. Um, for you that seems like a, you know, that's a very good program, that's a logical program, you've had to explain to you, but for a lot of people in the general public they don't quite realise um, the importance that um, needs to be put on actually making that come to fruition. And so we need to think about how do we advocate um, for those major programs, space, how do we advocate for why do we need to have a guided weapons and explosive ordnance capability in Australia, um, you know, um, why is that critical to not only our, um, uh, to some companies in, in Australia, but why is it critical to defence? So I think we, um, you know, you have a, a very important role in advocating, communicating, explaining, and, and you know, logically getting out there in the wider community in various ways and, and passing on those key messages. So thank you very much for that. Now I call on our Vice President, Israel uh, is one of the top 10 weapons exporters in the world. Australia is one of the world's largest weapons importers. Indeed, as Kim mentioned, only three years ago we imported more military equipment than any other country bar Saudi Arabia and exported less than countries such as Belarus, the Czech Republic and Norway. When Richard Miles, who was then the Shadow Defence Minister, addressed the National Press Club in 2018, he held up Israel as a model, saying that at the heart of Israel's rationale for a defence industry is a fundamental confidence in its own ability to build the best in order to make the Israeli Defence Force the best. Today, Kim has 
given us valuable insights into the capability of the defence industry that resides in this state and in our nation and the key opportunities. A capability that is not, in some commenters, as some comment commentators would have it, innately tied to the production of small arms and light weapons, but as the aerospace industry in New South Wales and the Australian F-35 program demonstrates a capability to produce advanced major conventional weapons and niche capabilities employing cutting-edge technology. Now, Israel has a population of some 8.6 million and has limited natural resources, incidentally about the same population as New South Wales of 8.2 million. Australia has a population of 25.5 million and has an abundance of natural resources. As Kim indicated, we are undoubtedly capable of building a globally competitive defence industry. And as Richard Miles in that same press club address said, a dull acceptance of Australian industry inferiority without any attempt to improve it is inexcusable. It's not it's clearly not without its challenges, but we must have the confidence in our own ability to build the best in order to make the Australian Defence Force the best. And the RUSI looks forward to working with Kim and with New South Wales based ADF units, defence industries and universities to promote informed debate and raise awareness to enable opportunities for globally competitive defence industries to thrive in New South Wales, the importance of which, as war looms in the Ukraine, is more salient than ever. We wish Kim well in his endeavours as the New South Wales Defence Advocate, and on behalf of the Institute, can I thank him for his very informative and erudite presentation. Please join me in expressing our appreciation. I'd just like to thank you very much for supporting us. Could I remind you of our role, which is to, to inform and promote debate on defence and security studies. And I'd like to complete my role this today by saying the board is discussing tonight and very soon some really significant new initiatives. We're looking at promoting RUSI through, for example, an influencer role where we will deliberately speak in a non-political way on events as they actually occur, rather than just every three months we publish something like United Service. By the way, that will continue. And we're also looking at expanding a range of activities like more monographs, relationships with cadet units, etc., etc., etc. In my view, it's an exciting time. I'd like to commend it to you. I'd like to thank the board for taking the journey as to what our decisions are very soon to be, and I hope that um, you'll, uh, you'll follow us with interest. And again, at the risk of being repetitive, thank you very much for supporting us on such a difficult day with virtually no public transport. Music